Okay, the second level of the top-down approach is the sector industry analysis. Now, sometimes people, students get confused between sector and industry. Sector is a bigger term. It groups more companies together. So you can have um, the technology sector, but inside the technology sector are many industries, software, hardware, um, electronics, semiconductors, different things like that. So sector is the bigger overarching grouping of companies um, and industry is a smaller subset of a sector. And then a sub-industry is a smaller subset of an, in, of an industry. So that's generally just to clear that up. Sector is the bigger one, industry is smaller, and then a sub-industry is even smaller. So um, a sector could be retail, and inside retail you have many different industries, uh, and then inside those industries you may have sub-industries. Okay, so industry analysis, of course, like I was saying before, is the second step in the common stock analysis. So you've done the economic analysis, you have an idea of what the economy is doing and who's likely to benefit. Now you need to do the sector industry analysis where you want to find the particular industries who are going to benefit the most. And there are industries that over the years have done better than other industries, you know, the, such as the computer industry over the last 30 years have done better than the automotive industry. Uh, if you look at you know, pharmaceuticals, there are sub-industries sub in the pharmaceuticals, maybe the biopharmaceuticals have done better than their, their parent industry or their parent sector, which would be healthcare. So pharmaceuticals will fall under healthcare, and then a sub-industry within healthcare could be biomedical pharmaceutical companies. Um, so the idea is to look for promising industries where you could uh, to have a good chance of making strong capital gains and then within that industry when we get to the third step, the fundamental analysis, we can actually find the one or two particular companies in the industry that have the best shot. Just like if you're looking at the fast food industry, there are a number of companies in the fast food industry but there are only two or three companies that are really growing and have good future potentials where some of the other companies are slowing down, shrinking, and some companies are just stabilizing. Okay. So before we could do our apply a lot of evaluation approaches, we want to get an idea of the industry that we should apply that to. And certain industries have different valuation approaches that work better for that industry opposed to other industries based on are they a manufacturer, are they a service industry, are they, you know, in technology. Um, and like anything in investments, continue ana continuous analysis is needed to keep on top of any type of investment. So a continuous industry analysis, a fundamental analysis, an economic analysis, because every day the prospects of these industries change. You know, just like in the energy sector, one big discovery in battery or solar generation could really shake up the rest of the components within the energy sector. You know, such as someone develops a solar panel that is, you know, 70% efficient and one four by three foot solar panel can power your whole house for a year plus generate excess power for the power grid. That would be a game changer and if that happened everybody would have to really reassess the uh, energy sector. So over time industry, different industries perform in different cycles. Some industries are in constant decline. Some industries uh, will grow and slow along with the business cycle and some industries you know, as they become more commonplace in society, become an ever-growing, ever-expanding industry, such as electronics and technology in our society. Over the last 30 years, the amount of electronics and computer components and computers people have, have exploded. You know, in the 1980s, it was rare for a person to own one computer. In the 1990s, generally families shared a computer. Today, people have multiple computers. I myself have seven. So, yeah, if I count my office computer, my home computer, my laptop, my old laptop, my old desktop, you know, uh, my iPad, I count that as a computer, even my cell phone. So, 
The, the, the single person has multiple PCs, just like you have multiple PCs. You probably currently have a laptop, but you may have an old desktop when you were younger, or another laptop that you grew out of, or you know, a Surface. I see you have the Surface there. That's considered a computer. You know, they have, there's big news on the Surface. They're coming out with a $500 Surface that um, is supposed to be a big hit. We'll see. Um, so, so the, the point of time you're in is going to be relevant to how well your industry performs. And the stock performance is going to be affected by the industry. So if your stock's in an upward mo um, moving industry with lots of potential and people, people are favoring that industry, then your stock will get some benefits from that. There could be an industry, maybe a sub-industry like cloud computing. So companies that are building the ca capabilities or incorporating cloud uh, capabilities um, or anything connected to cloud computing, even the smaller companies that really don't deserve good valuations or large stock prices are getting praise because they're part of this industry and people are saying that this could be a potential future big player, let me get in now. So just because they're attached to that industry, they're doing well. And certain industries in decline should be recognized and avoided. So they're industries that, you know, if you consider, say, a sub-industry of VSH tapes, VHS tapes. Those are those, tr those big tapes before we had CDs, if that was a sub-industry. People who make those uh, um, cassette recorders and those tapes, we probably consider that a dying industry and should be avoided, although I think it's completely dead now and completely avoided. But if you, I guess now you would, maybe you would want to look at uh, Blu-ray players and Blu-ray discs and you know, DVDs, because eventually those are going to go disappear. As the internet is faster, um, today's computers don't even accept CDs or CD-ROMs or DVDs. And you know, at a certain point, everything's going to be downloaded so efficiently that there's no, really no need to have um, any of these, these mediums. You know, even today, um, memory sticks are starting to disappear as well because things like Dropbox and the box and the cloud can easily store all your files on, on the cloud. Why carry a stick around with you that could be lost or stolen or damaged? So we do like the consistency of performance in industry. Some industries are much more stable and perform at a more reliable rate. And you know, some industries are considered growth industries and they can main up, maintain that position for a long time. And if you are in a growth industry, generally the stocks in the industry do better. Um, now, the question is, can we predict future performance of industries based on their past success? Um, you know, you could rank the industries, you could look at, you know, performance year over year, but unfortunately, um, past performance of certain industries are never going to be a 100% guaranteed predictor of future performance. Although it is a start, looking at industries that have performed well over the last five years is a good clue that they'll probably likely perform better or the same in the future, but it's not a guarantee. This is a, a perform industry performance over time chart. Now, this I realize you can't really make heads or tail of this, but I'm going to show you the website that this comes from. It's an interesting tool to sort of look at um, different industries, utilities, healthcare, uh, infrastructure. I guess name a few of them in here. They they all have abbreviations. These industries, but this chart shows the top of the chart is the best performing industries, and the bottom of the chart is the worst performing. And the color shows you the actual industry. So this is something that uh, there's a website here that I put into the, into the PowerPoint that you could go to, that you can play around with that could give you um, this information. So here are the S&P 500 sector performance. So if you click on any of the, any of the this is the telecom, and you could see that all, the, all their colors highlight. So you can get an idea of that. And you see how they jump around quite a bit. So sometimes some of the uh, best performing industries may come from, become one of the worst performing industries. So healthcare in 2013 and 2014 were really good industries, but in 20, uh, 2004, 2005, 2010, 
Not so much. So down here, um, they'll give you an annual and the best and the worst for each of the um, indexes, energy, financials, consumer. And these are more sectors, not really industries. Utilities, telecom, materials, industrials, information technology. So, and you can see information technology is usually the most volatile. And you see here that uh, they had a lot of years where they did really well in 1990s and 80s. And in the, the, the lost decade, not so well. Uh, although it did come back strongly in 2009 with a 61% return. And last year with a 20% return, um, it's very volatile. So this is a great website that you may want to check out that to look at industries uh, and industry performance. And certainly, when you're working your analyst report, you want to comment about the industry your company lives in, the industry and the sector, and the performance over time. So this would be a great utility to go to to pull out some information about. And this shows you the risk. So if there's a big, so if you look at the, or just look at the technology sector, that should be brought up. That sometimes this sector, although it can perform very strongly, can have years of weakness. So these are, this is a, um, a nice tool to use for your analyst report to kind of talk about the, especially in the risk section, you may want to talk about the risk associated with the industry or the sector, or how this company, how you believe this company fits into the industry, and that it's a top end of the industry, and you know, if they're very, so that's what ultimately what you want, to find the most successful industry for next year, and then the most successful stock within that industry. That should produce the best returns. So if you, I mean, we don't know what's going to be the most successful industry in 2015. Say it's healthcare. What company in healthcare has the best chances of uh, doing well in 2015? So if you knew the best sector and the best company in the sector, you have a real winner for the year. And that's sort of what you're trying to uh, go for in these analyst reports. And this, that's one website that can help you. So sometimes industry clarifications are not always clear cut. There are some companies that could live between industries, between sectors, some companies that are conglomerates or um, have two main business, businesses in two different industries. So that's always a little bit more complicated. And not, not every company is a pure play. Some companies may have, generally if a majority of the company's business is in one industry or sector, that's where we'll classify it. They could have small sub-businesses in other areas that or similar industries, or, or maybe even different uh, sectors, but majority of the company's business is where we generally categorize them. So, because, you know, and it's not uncommon for businesses to want to diversify their, their businesses so they will be a little bit more stable and they're not so reliant on one product or one source of industry. I think you know a company like GE could be an example of that had they have their hands in many different types of products in many different industries. And that just makes them a little bit more stable, a little bit more protection against any industry or sector specific down, downturns. Now, there are classification codes for industries. One is the standard industrial classification. There are others, but basically people have tried to come up with um, a consensus of where companies should fall into what industry and what sector and what sub-industry and issue them multiple digit codes to try and organize companies and that's how websites and different like we looked at Hoover's and Yahoo uh, can, can easily group companies into different sectors or industries because they've all been assigned a code by you know one or two agencies to kind of help distinguish what company can be and where. But you yourself, uh, in general, can do this too. I mean, you, if, you, if you think about you know, certain industries you're more familiar with, you can figure out what companies belong in an industry. You know, for example, like I said, I worked with semiconductor companies for a while. I can tell you, I can easily put together a list of companies that are in a semiconductor area, just to my basic knowledge of working with these companies, knowing the competitors are. Um, so a lot of your own business knowledge can, can uh, can help you separate these companies. But for some companies you may not be sure of, there are these classification codes that you could easily look up online. Um, now, when we analyze the industry, we have to know 
how the industry fits into the business cycle and, and specifically the life cycle of their products and industry in general. So a life cycle is, is not a new idea. I'm sure you've heard of this before. But it helps determine the, the health and the future um, performance of this, uh, the, the companies within the industry. So there are, um, we could say, four, three to four stages, depending on how you want to break it out. If we look at the first stage, the pioneering stage, this is when there's an idea comes up. And the company starts to get into place and starts to get known, and rapid growth can develop. And opportunities may attract other firms and other venture capitalists. And it's really difficult to say who's going to be the survivor, because it seems like there's a lot of companies. At one point, there are many automobile companies in the United States, over 20, and it kind of got boiled down to three for a long time. In uh, internet and online technologies, there were many companies that looked promising. Uh, but at, one, at a certain point, you really weren't sure. In 1999, you weren't sure if Yahoo, Amazon, and this is even before Google, a lot of these companies were going to make it or what their future prospects were really going to be. So the pioneering stage is really where they're kind of battling out, they're consolidating, and there's a rapid growth or interest you know, in the new industry or sector or sub-industry. Now here's sort of a, um, another way of looking at it. There can be an introduction to a new type of product. Say uh, 10 or so years ago, the DVR was a new type of product. And TiVo was the first company that pioneered and developed the DVR, vigil, video recording assistant for televisions. And there was a growth phase where TiVos were doing very well. But that attracted a lot of cable companies who wanted to sell their own DVRs directly to their cable subscribers. So there was a, an extreme growth with competition and people weren't sure that TiVo was going to survive. But now that there's been almost, we're sort of entering the maturity phase of these D DVRs where uh, a majority of households uh, through their cable companies or through TiVo, TiVo have a DVR-like device. It's so popular now that they actually do TV ratings. They look at how many people watch the show live, how many people have recorded it and watched it within the next three days. So, but at a certain point, there's going to be a decline in this industry where, you know, and I could see changes in this industry already. Uh, already Cablevision has a new cable box where the DVR isn't based in the house. There's no hard drive in the house. It's cloud-based. So that way they could say they could record 15 shows at once and you could have 15,000 shows ready for playback because it's all being stored not in the physical drive in my house but up in the cloud. And at a certain point, the DVRs are going to be all cloud-based, and there's not going to be a physical um, box anymore for it. So now it's sort of, is it the same industry or is it a different industry? Uh, and, and eventually, I, I kind of foresee that in the future, it really, TV will really be more like sort of like the Netflix experience, but everything will be available on demand. Uh, so there are no schedules. There's just sort of all your content uh, is available at any time in the cloud and you just pull down what you want to watch and then maybe you pay for what you watch or you you buy a subscription, unlimited subscription or something to sort of uh, manage your video entertainment. I mean Netflix is taking a big step in that model but imagine uh, a marketplace where all content's available for every TV show that was ever aired past and present uh, in every movie that's available and you really just kind of make your own viewing. You don't really subscribe. The network, uh, as we know it, is sort of dead. There's really no, it's really just companies that provide TV shows. There's no network that groups them together anymore. Okay. So the growth or expansion stage is the exciting stage. This is the stage where people recognize this is a great product and as soon as they get the money, I want to get this product. Sort of like HDTVs a number of years ago when people recognized that this was going to be where the TV is at and the older TVs uh, now I find it hard to even find an older TV in someone's house. Everybody seems to have moved into past, you know, pretty much past this expansion phase as far as HD TVs. And now they have, I guess, the Ultra HD. It's sort of a new level of high definition they're trying to come out with to, re to um, get a new product that you have to replace your HD TV with, with the Ultra High Def TV at some point. But um, 
in in the growth phase, in the growth phase, especially with TVs, there are a lot of manufacturers in the beginning of this industry that aren't there today, and a lot of new manufacturers that are there today. So survivors from the pioneering stage, uh, if they're lucky enough to su survive the pioneering stage and make it into the growth st or expansion stage, that's where a lot of the money is. That's where companies first go IPO and uh, a lot of interest and a lot of appreciation of stock price develops in its growth, growth and expanding phase. So um, operations become more stable and dependent. Um, it's more easier for them to attract investment funds, especially for IPOs or bonds, and the companies really become a lot bigger in this phase. Now the stabilization and maturity phase, uh, this is when growth begins to moderate, where growth isn't double digits anymore, it's maybe single digits, or majority of people own the product and now you're living off replacements. You know, similar to HDTVs, the majority of people have the HDTV, so you're trying to live off if they're gonna replace it for a bigger size or different features. And the marketplace it, at this point is going to be full of competitors, but costs are going to be stable or decreasing. So a lot of the focus in this particular maturity or stabilization phase may be how can we maximize our profits or maybe even lower prices to consumer and gain more market share by managing our costs and reducing our costs. So a lot of this stabilization and maturity phase is about stabilizing the product as well, making uh, more efficient components, making the, you know, being able to, the, the product sometimes becomes more of a commodity where it's selling and it starts selling at a lower and lower price. Sort of like computers. Once computers, computers used to be very, very, very expensive. You know, a home PC in today's money uh, back in the 80s could have been $5,000 to $10,000 for a home PC. And now we could get PCs, um, these netbooks, for two, three, four hundred dollars easily. So the, the price has come down as that industry uh, matured, stabilized, and the focus was more on um, reducing price. Uh, now, and then, and then eventually you get into a decline stage where, um, say if it was desktops was the sub-industry, that's in decline because more people are looking to buy laptops or um, convenient type of iPads or Surface tablets that can do everything you know, once you get sort of a Surface tablet or an iPad, you find yourself turning your computer on less and less. Because it used to be you turn your computer every day on every day to check email, surf the web, do, you know, work in Excel, different things like that. And once you have an iPad, it's just more comfortable to sit on the couch and, and, and work with that and do a majority of what you could do online on your, on your PC. So that becomes less of an importance. Um, so again, uh, w what people are going to focus on is going to be sales and market share in a way to capture. The industry isn't growing by new customers as much as it is by stealing customers from existing competitors. And that's sort of a big, so if your industry you know, is in that sort of phase, you have to realize where your industry is. And that's something you may include in your investment report as well, your idea of where your company lies in this um, product life cycle. So you can get an expectation of returns. In the growth phase, there should be a lot of returns, but this, you know, in the pioneering phase, it's very risky. Returns are gonna be, there may be no returns. So a lot of these bioengineering, biotechnology, pharmaceutical stocks are in the pioneering stage trying to make products that will cure cancer, cure certain diseases, but they haven't really made any money yet. Um, if companies go into the, um, um, a mature, stage, capital gains may be very difficult to come by, but the company may be paying more dividends. You know, so, um, and of course the expansion stage uh, with rapid growth is where you want to be for capital gains. So the, the stage you're in is going to result in a general idea of how your stock should do. And hopefully though your company is in the top, one of the top companies in the industry or sector. Because that's going to mean the top companies are the ones that generally get the most benefit depending on where they are in the life cycle. I mean, you could look at cigarettes as sort of a mature, possibly declining industry, but the biggest, you want to be involved with the biggest companies in the industry because they're still making money, they're still paying dividends, they're still finding ways to make profits. I wouldn't be so supportive of a new cigarette company because I think they have a real you know, uphill battle to get market share from all the established players and there's not a real 
a, a huge amount of growth with new cons consumers. Okay. So some of the qualitative uh, aspects of industry and sectors, of course, is historical performance, which we mentioned or talked about a little bit before. Um, and here again, we're looking at sales and earnings growth performance to be considered, even though past performance cannot be uh, a guarantee of future performance, it's always good to understand where the stocks have been, their performance in their industry or sub-industry in the past. You know, and how, you know, some industries just have very generous profit margins. You know, if we're looking at the software indus industry, they generally have very good profit margins. And that's one of the reasons that the software industry has higher PEs and higher stock prices is because um, they're able to have generous profit margins because they don't really have a physical product. And the product's becoming even less physical as we move forward and more and more software is available for download. In fact, Adobe no longer sells a physical product. They sell a subscription to their Adobe suite of creative uh, design programs, Photoshop, Dreamweaver, Flash, these are all things that you don't get a disc anymore, you don't buy the package, you, you pay 20 to $40 as a subscription every month to utilize it. And then they maintain it, you get it through a download and they maintain upgrades of it. Um, so even in the software industry, things are changing and becoming even less physical. And the less physicalness there is, the more profits. Because if it's not a physical product and you don't have to share it with a retailer. One of the reasons Microsoft wanted to but later abandoned the concept of all games will be downloaded to the Xbox One directly. You don't have to go to GameStop to buy any Xbox games. And of course there was, um, GameStop was extremely threatened by this and a lot of consumers didn't like the idea of this because then they couldn't sell their used games. But Microsoft loved the idea because every, and the, and the software companies loved the idea because every game gets sold new and there's not, it's no really, no easy way of transferring it to another person. So that's, an example of how the competitive conditions can change within the industry. Um, and, and a good example of this, you know, if you look at Blockbuster through the four stages of pioneering the, you know, growth, ma maturity, and decline, Blockbuster went through all these, th all these phases within a period of 20 years. Where most companies, these four, to go through all four of these phases used to take 30, 40, 50 years. Now the, the actual time frame of these life, life cycles of products are much shorter to the point today where, you know, Blockbuster is gone. Okay, this is another a common concept that's good to know about and should be in your analyst report, at least a cursory discussion, not a, a huge in-depth discussion, but if you're looking about risks of your company, uh, talking about Porter's uh, competitive factors, these five are covered in numerous courses, uh, including business strategy, maybe marketing, management, uh, so there shouldn't be, I'll go through them quickly, but there's nothing here that should be too new to you. But basically, if you're going to do a stock analysis of a company, you should know, as far as your risk section of the analysis report, you should talk about the threat of new entrants. New companies coming into, the, into this, this company's industry or, or area. So this could be something that, you know, when Nintendo was the leader of video game industry, and they kind of had a little problem with uh, PlayStation um, when they came to be, but Sony was going to work with Nintendo, but they had a, um, a dispute, and then Sony said, well, we'll just make our own gaming platform instead. I think Sony was going to provide the computer chips to Nintendo, and Nintendo decided to give the contract to somebody else, so Sony, after investing a lot of time developing these chips, they said, well, we'll just make a PlayStation, so they became a new entrant. And it stole a lot of Nintendo's business. And later, uh, Microsoft had a huge amount of money they didn't know what to do with, so they figured, well, let's waste it on a gaming console division and, and see how that goes. And that came around. So, you know, the threat, is, how likely is it, though, for someone to become uh, a new competitor in the industry? In, in the video game console industry, not likely. Uh, but it can happen. Uh, you can look at the bargaining power of buyers. So, if if your company is going to buy a significant amount of materials, they are going to have some bargaining power. So Walmart is a classic example of a buyer of, you know, they buy merchandise. They have a significant amount of buying power uh, 
oh, uh, so when they want to buy socks or shirts or whatever they have at Microsoft, they can demand lower costs and lower, lower prices to them uh, when they're buying these materials because they're such a large order. Some companies are 50% of their business, so they can dictate the terms a little bit more aggressively. The rivalry among existing competitors. Again, how much competition is in your industry? And, and how much are they fighting each other on price and, and to the point where the, the profits have been squeezed out tremendously? And one area we could look at this is in airlines. Airlines have historically have had price wars and price battles that have kept their profitability and their profits low in particular points of their history. Uh, substitute products or services. Now when we say a substitute product, we don't mean switching Coke for Pepsi. We mean switching Coke for water as a substitute product. I mean, if the, if the idea is something to drink to quench your thirst, then you know, switching from one soda to another soda isn't a substitute product. That's just basically the same product. But switching to water as a concept, there's a time where very few people drank water. And everything you drank at dinner or lunch was always a beverage, a soda, milk, tea. Uh, to this point in day and age where a lot of people go to restaurants and they'll have water. Or you'll just drink water with your meal and it's not a big deal. That would be a substitute product. Or when you say a substitute service, that would be um, one service that can replace, replace another service, but it's completely two different ways of solving a similar problem. You know, for example, I'm trying to think of a, can't come up with a good example, but uh, move on to the next one. The bargaining power of suppliers. So if the supplier is one of the only suppliers of this particular component, you know, say there was only one company that could make tires. Now all the, all the auto repair places and uh, tire companies, they're at the mercy of this one supplier. You know, or if there's a raw material, this only, this, only this one company is able to procure and sell palm oil or rubber or something like that. They have a bargaining power of, the, of being, being a, a supplier that, you know, maybe one of two or three particular suppliers. And if somebody runs out and you're the only supplier of this material, you really have a bargaining position over the people you're selling to. You know. Um, just think about if there was only one gas station company in your town, one gas station and one company that runs it, they could really charge whatever they want. You know, so if you get into, you, you, in some areas are like this, where there's very few gas stations and gas prices are much higher. But if you get into an area where there's six or seven gas stations, all of a sudden you notice that they're all competing to be the lowest price. Because people could just drive down the block, see six gas stations, and then, okay, take note, this one is the lowest price. You come back later, that's the gas station you're going to. That's why oftentimes, when I'm, I'm riding down the road, I'll see the same price at multiple gas stations because you know, they're all trying to, you know, they don't want to lose any business because gas is a commodity. You know, don't believe the hype. Gas, sta gas at any gas station in Long Island comes from the same source, the same terminal. Exxon doesn't have their own special gas or, you know, their own, spe that's all crap. You know, each of these gas station companies are filling up at the same gas, from the same, pretty much the same refinery that's living, delivering the gas, the same tank holders, and the gas trucks just pull up and there's two octanes, 87 and 94, and they mix them to get every grade in between, but it's all the same gas. So you're not getting, if you go to the discount gas station that's an off-brand gas station, you're getting the same exact gas as at the brand name mobile gas station, because they're getting it from the same supplier. They don't have, we don't have the infrastructure to store gas for 10 different companies and 10 different tanks and 10 different delivery systems, you know, but um, they, they try to get you to believe their gas is special and different. But it's not, you know. So, um, I'm going to move on. <laughs> All right. So, government effects. Of course, you want to talk about how the government affects your industry. Regulations are a big a, a part of that. Is the government going to make it more expensive for you to do business? Put more rules and regulations on you? You know, if it's a pharmaceutical company, or if it's a an energy company or even an airline industry, there's going to be costs associated with the governmental effects. Uh, structural changes in uh, the economy. Um, 
can be advantages or disadvantages to, you, to your industry. You know, in this, in this United States, we've been moving from an industrial to an information to a communication society. Uh, and these shifts occur, new industries are created. And all the older industries die off. So when, you know, if you look at the structure of the, the economy of the world and the economy of particular nations, things are changing and this is gonna create new opportunities and kill off older companies. And that's just how the world works. So if you're someone who can really spot these changes and really recognize a shift in dynamics that's gonna open up uh, real possibilities to certain industries, those are the companies you wanna be invested in. So you really have to kind of be aware and look around and say, you know, what's happening in this world? What can you sort of foresee? What companies do you really see that are going to go away? And what new companies are going to be developed? You know, if it's at the retail industry, there's certain retail industries that there's no need for me to shop there anymore. I can get everything I need from Amazon. So if it's, so if it's Radio Shack, why do I need to go to Radio Shack to pay higher prices for things with a smaller selection? Where I can pay lower prices in the largest selection at Amazon or Best Buy or, you know, so certain stores, they just are past their prime. And other stores are new and upcoming with new innovative ideas and designs and formats that can propel them forward. And you know, in the fast food industry, you have every once in a while you have a company like Chipotle Mexican Grill or Panera Bread or possibly um, this new, new company that just had an IPO this year. Yeah, Shake Shack. That if you've been to a Shake Shack, it's nice. It's very open, there's lots of windows. It has a nice interior design. The food's really good that has a potential for displacing a lot of older fast food, pla fast food places in the market, such as like a White Castle or even a Wendy's. If they're just old and boring or the food has gotten to such a low quality point because they've been, they've been competing on price so much that the ingredients of the food have been so terrible, that somebody coming in with a better product, like Panera, Chipotle, or Shake Shack, you pay more for that, but you're willing to pay more because now the quality's back in the food. You know, it's not always about price. So, Structural changes in the way we, we purchase, and health is a big concern too. So one of the reasons Panera Bread, I guess, has done well, or even Chipotle, is they focus a little bit on health. Chipotle focuses more on the quality of their ingredients, um, and Panera may focus more on healthier salad selections and things like that, but that's an important change. So, so evaluating future industry prospects is sort of like I've been talking about, forecasting the long-term prospects of those industries. So if you look at healthcare, long-term, for a while now, long-term has been good for healthcare because the aging populations of the world are gonna utilize and need more healthcare. And also the, um, the uh, um, increase in income for many of the world's citizens over the last 30 years, many of the world's citizens have moved out of poverty and into the middle class, they can actually afford healthcare. So that's going to put more demands on more medications, more supplements, more doctor visits. So healthcare is probably a good long-term industry. So some industries are obvious candidates for growth and prosperity, like healthcare, even technology. Technology is with us. It's not going away. We're never going to go backwards and use less technology. We're probably going to want and demand more, more technology. We have a craving or an addiction for new technology. We, we want to, even though we may not want to own the Apple iWatch, we still want to check it out. You know, we want to look at a lot of these new technologies that developed because they're of interest to us. They can help us with our lives. We're sort of so closely attached to them. You know, and some industries have had a difficult time moving from the industrial age into the information-based economy. And those industries are going to wither away and die as the informational economy sort of takes over or makes a better solution. So, to pick, so the real idea here is what industry can I pick for next year that's going to be a winner? Now, um, who is likely to show the most improvement in growth in their industry and their stock prices? W one way to do this is, now this is not something that, that we're doing in this class, but in, if you're a large company that analyzes stocks and mutual funds and builds mutual funds, you're going to want to build an earnings estimate for industries, for all industries, and say, based on the best data that we can put together, we can extrapolate all the earnings for all industries, and we can start to get an idea of what industries are going to do the best next year. And although these earnings estimates are, of course, we've discussed it, not always accurate, we also want to look at the industries and their 
escalation of PE ratio. So we want industries that are continuing to improve their PE ratio year over year. That the PE ratio for the industry is moving from 18 to 20 to 22 to 25 because that's a tide that's going to lift all stocks inside the industries. Um, so investors, if you find investors will pay a lot for a, a, a company within an industry. So you, if investors have recognized the best company within one of the better industries, those companies typically have very high P, PE multiples. So if you're looking at your stock analysis spreadsheet that you developed, and you look at the PE, if you're calculating PE, the company with the highest PE is probably, you know, if you look at the two companies with the two highest PEs, they're probably the two best companies in the industry. Because that's, that's what the majority of investors have already voted. PE is sort of a measure of likes. How many likes, how many times um, stock investors click like, and when I say click like, they click buy more stock and push the price higher, which pushes the PE higher. So looking at PE is an easy way to say which companies are probably um, the most liked in your industry and may be the best opportunities to buy. Not always, sometimes some companies um, price goes up too fast too quickly and there may be a competitor that's just as good that isn't as well recognized yet. That's a good to move into as a second place. Okay. Also, we have to worry about the direction of interest rates. Um, and that's going to significantly uh, affect uh, many industries and many companies, especially banking. Uh, so you have to be aware of how sensitive is your industry to interest rates. If it's an industry that involves, say, um, housing, they're very sensitive to interest rates. So if it's a housing industry, one of the many housing industries uh, or companies tied to the purchase of new homes, and interest rates go up, which they're likely to go up next year, then home sales should slow, and this will affect those industries. Industries can also be affected by political uh, events, technology, inflation. These are all things that should be considered too. How, what is, and this ties back to the step one, the economic analysis can kind of look at this. How is the you know, economy going to be and interest rates and how will that affect a particular industry? And of course, we talked about the business cycle. Um, we want to know where your company, where your industry is in the business cycle and because that's going to affect returns as well. So earning expectations are for growth companies and growth industries are significantly higher than, than slower moving industries. Uh, so growth stocks typically do the best under an expanding economy, expanding bull market, but do the worst in a recession. So growth stocks are very vulnerable in a recession because they, they typically tend to be a little highly valued during expansion, so a recession can quickly uh, collapse the price of a growth stock as their growth prospects slow due to the slowing economy, and many investors want to sell to, cap, to lock in their gains. And that brings us to defensive and cyclical industries. Defensive industries, which we've talked about this before, they're the least affected by recessions and economic adversity. So soda, beer, medications, cigarettes, these are things that people don't engage in less when there's a recession. Sometimes they engage in them more. Um, maybe boy, beer might be a good example of that. If you're depressed over the economy, you might drink a little bit more. But these, these, these staples of everyday life typically are recession proof. Even a company like Kraft Foods that produce a lot of uh, lower price uh, grocery, uh, grocery store stables like Kraft macaroni and cheese and different things like that, they're not going to do any worse by the recession. They actually may actually do better in a recession as people give up some of the more expensive foods and trade down to some low, uh, lower price foods that Kraft specializes in. Now the cyclical industries are most affected by recessions such as the auto industry, Computers, semiconductors, uh, large uh, appliances um, typically do bad in a recession. These are, think of industries where, um, you know, if it's uh, uh, an industry where they make boats or uh, recreational vehicles, these are things that during a recession people may put off purchasing these more extravagant, not, you know, types of purchases and not really an everyday purchase required for maintaining their, their life. So the cyclical, in, cyclical industries are something that you want to shy away from during a recession, but maybe buy back into during an expansion. 
Now, a countercyclical industry, uh, they exist as well, which may be, and the countercyclical is different than defensive because the countercyclical, they do very well during uh, recessions and poorly doing economic expansions. Sometimes education, higher education, if a re there's a recession, high unemployment, people may seek, a lot more people will seek to go back to school to increase their opportunities, but when in a very competitive job market, uh, uh, less people have the need to continue their education or get advanced degrees because the job prospects and the money that's out there already, it's just not needed. Companies aren't as picky when hiring and don't require as many advanced degrees. Okay. So interest sensitive industries, we had talked about this already. Um, <clears throat> any, any um, like credit card entries can, can also be interest sensitive if, if um, but they're, they're tricky because you, they can charge higher interest rates, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're making higher profits because they may actually have to pay uh, higher interest rates themselves than the money they're borrowing to lend to you. But by and large, you may buy less on your credit cards during a recession because of the higher interest rates. You just can't afford You may like to spend more on the credit cards because you don't have enough money, but the higher interest rates prohibit that. So uh, where the interest rates are going is a very difficult thing to forecast, but if you can get an accurate forecast on in interest rates, you can make a lot of money specifically in bonds, though, more so than stocks. So sector rotation is the idea of let me sell out of certain sectors that aren't going to do well and move into other sectors that are going to do better. So if I'm a mutual fund manager and I have a large mutual fund and I have to stay invested in stocks through expansions and contractions, I can't, don't have the liberty of selling everything and you know, I have to keep a certain amount of my money in stocks, I'm going to do sector rotation to improve the performance of my mutual fund. So if a recession is coming, I'm going to sell out of those growth industries, buy more defensive industries, and then when the recession is ending, I may sell those defensive industries, go into more cyclical or growth industries, or do this analysis to figure out what industries are the industries likely to do the best in the next five years, sell the poorer performing industries, and move into the better industries. So just a way of managing large portfolios of stock is rotating by sector. Okay, so that brings us to company analysis, which is step three in the top-down approach from chapter 15. So just to review, the top-down approach is step one, economic analysis. Like President Clinton had said, it's the economy, stupid. And you really need to know where the economy is right now. That certainly you can understand where the economy has been for the last 12 months, because we have the data, we have the input, we've crunched the numbers. And there's enough information out there to get a general idea of how things are going to go the next three to six months, even the next year. So for example, right now you may say, well, there's nothing particularly out there that says that we should have a recession. So you expect to be more standard operating procedure of um, slow to moderate growth. You know? So if that's the case, then, then you have a better idea of going into step two, which industries will uh, have the best chance of making the most capital gains within this three to six month period or past possibly 12 months if you're that daring and then step three the step we're in now is company analysis and that's the fundamental analysis and this ties greatly to majority of your industry report analysis report on your stock uh, is going to be a lot of what's included in this chapter so this chapter is going to be uh, a lot more slides a little bit longer than what you're used to Okay, so the goal is to estimate a share's intrinsic value. And we've talked about intrinsic value before. And we want to you know, uh, develop an intrinsic value, which is the price we think the stock is worth, and you, by using justified fundamentals. Just like if you were going to buy a car or a house, you wouldn't just accept the sticker price on it. You would want to do some sort of analysis independently to figure out how valuable this car or this house is. In fact, companies have been uh, developed on this concept alone. There are companies that um, rate the book value of a car and there's a company called Zillow that independently rates the value of your home based on um, data available to it. It's a website and then you can kind of look up in any area and it gives you an estimate of the housing price based on the data it puts together. So these are you know um, very sought after pieces of information in the world. The actual intrinsic value of assets. 
So the fundamental analysis is again company level analysis that we're going to looking at basic financial variables in order to estimate the intrinsic value. So when I say basic financial variables, I'm talking about balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flows, utilizing financial ratios to help figure out uh, what companies are the best to invest in. One of the reasons that you put that uh, spreadsheet together of stock and financial information is to get the data that you're going to need to analyze. So variables can include sales, profit margins, depreciation, tax rate, sources of financing, asset utilization. These are just some of the variables you should think about. Um, an additional analysis can be uh, the firm's competitive, competitive position in the industry, labor relations, technological changes, management, foreign competition. This di additional analysis falls under the risk section, looking at the risks and the potential issues that the company could face in the coming years. That's all part of the intrinsic value because intrinsic value, a big component in intrinsic value is risk. So the higher risks for the company, the less valuable it is. Okay. So the end result of this fundamental analysis is, um, is getting a good understanding of where the company is and its future potential. How the financial variables relate to the real value of the company and hopefully this accumulates in a decision to come up with um, a per share price for this company. And a lot of this for many analysts concentrate on earnings and PE ratios. Because at the heart, that's the value of the company. Because the company is really as valuable. Every company's major goal is to maximize shareholders' wealth. That's why companies are in existence. You, you start a company to make money and you want to maximize the shareholders or the owner's wealth. That's the goal of a company. That's what the managers of a company are trying to do. So earnings are very important because they drive stock price. And the stock price is what drives the P.E. ratio, stock and earnings. So the future po um, profitability is the most fundamentally important thing uh, affecting the intrinsic value of a company and the stock price of a company. Therefore, earnings per share, stock price, they're closely related and, and have to have a priority on your list of analysis. So how is earnings per share derived and what does earnings per share represent? Well, earnings per share um, is a boiled down uh, piece of information from the financial statements. Income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. Um, this is where a majority of a company's financial information that you need lives. So the earnings per share is basically net profits divided by the amount of outstanding shares. So you could look at it at a per share basis. And the more that this grows, the better the company is as an investment. And you could compare this over time. You know, if companies are consistently increasing the earnings per share quarter after quarter, those are companies you want to be involved with, you want to earn. Um, so a lot of times, this focus is not so much on how these financial statements are constructed, but on how they're used and how they're evaluated. Because we have gap to sort of moderate and, and determine how financial statements are allowed to be constructed. So you don't really have to get involved in that. You have to be more involved in the analysis side of these financial statements. Um, now, the earnings per share for a company is not always, I mean, here it says not a precise figure. What they mean is that when you're looking at comparing this over time between companies, it's not always something that should be 100% comparable between companies or between time frames. Because different companies do have, and companies, companies themselves can change their accounting treatment from year over year, or different companies with indus different industries have different accounting treatments on how they prepare or want to prepare the statements. There's different modalities of depreciation. There's straight line method, dollar declining method, there's the modified accelerated cost recovery system for depreciation. So companies have a wiggle room or an ability to adjust how they're going to uh, construct their financial statements. In the costing of the inventories, they could use a standard cost. They could use a average cost. They could do ABC, you know, FIFO or LIFO types of uh, costing of assets and inventory. So um, not everybody constructs their financial statements identically. So must, investors need to be aware of these differences in, in, in financial statements. Um, 
to get a better, a true performance of a company because a company in one year could do something tricky in their financial statements that make them look a lot more profitable than they ever been before. So investors really need to look and say, why are they suddenly so much more profitable? Oh, okay, I see what they're doing. They're accelerating their depreciation and, you know, or they're changing the depreciation cycle or they're, they're moving assets off the books into a offshore company or they, you know, different things that they can do. Because remember, the company's perspective, they want the company to seem as profitable as possible. So if it means doing legitimate accounting um, strategies to make the company look better, they're going to do that because not, not all investors will pick up on that. So it's something you should just be aware of. So if you want to take a really close look, which you don't really have time to do that in this class, so just accept the financial statements as given. But if you were a full-time stock analyst assigned to a sub-industry, you are going to take a really close look at the financial statements, um, examining their 10Ks, which is additional information beyond those three financial statements I had mentioned, reading the footnotes of the financial statements, because a lot of these, what they do, they have to, they have to uh, recognize or publish what they're doing if they're making any changes, and a lot of that is placed in the footnotes. If they're changing the way that they're going to calculate their financial statements, they need to have a rational reason why and the consistency to it, and that's all going to be in the footnotes. Um, look at opinions of other independent analysts, see if they picked anything up. And most of these analysts who are taking a really close look at financial statements are going to focus a great deal on cash flow statement. Because the cash flow statement is the one statement that is very hard to hide things in. So when you're in specifically looking at the cash flow of operations, the money coming in and coming out of the business based on the pure operations. Not the financing aspect of raising capital and interest and borrowing money uh, and paying taxes, but the real core cash of the business. And then distinguishing how, what cash is being generated from investments, from financing, or from operations. We want the cash flow from operations is much more valuable to us than the money they borrow or the money they may have made from a one-time investment sale. And that's why you, know, you sometimes need to know where the source of these profits or cash are coming from. You know, um, and stock valuation is always forward-looking, though. We, do, we only have the past financial statements to analyze, but the idea is to try to extrapolate them forward. Um, now, with earnings per share, we can move that forward because a lot of companies will give us earnings estimates, sales estimates, profitability estimates that we could kind of reconstruct their earnings per share. So, one, we need to know how to obtain an earnings estimate, and two, we need to consider the accuracy of the earnings estimate that they that you've obtained. So companies will, some companies, but not all, they don't have to, but most companies will provide you guidance on their revenues, their profits, their earnings per share for the next year. You have to figure out, is this really accurate? Are their estimates, can we really, what confidence do we have in their estimates? And three, understand the role of earnings surprises that impact stock prices. Uh, now, earnings surprises are something that I tell you as a company, I'm going to have $5 earnings per share. I come out with $6 earnings per share. Everyone's happy and the stock moves up a great deal that surprise day. Everybody likes surprises, including investors. So a lot of companies sometimes under forecast their earnings per share in order to constantly develop these surprises every, every, every quarter because it's almost expected or looked at as you know, something that's valuable. So there are these earnings games that companies play that when they're giving guidance, they're trying to manage that guidance lower so they can come up and surprise. And that's why it's really devastating when a, when a company, they may, they may meet their earnings expectations, but that's actually looked as a negative to investors because they're looking for that surprise. But if they actually come below earnings, then we know a real problem has existed that they didn't foresee. And, and that's why stocks really collapse in their prices whenever they disappoint or miss their earnings targets. So the, the textbook talks about this a little bit more. The, the earnings game is called, where companies are managing their earnings to make, facilitate these surprises. But they're also managing their businesses to make sure they can meet these earnings per share. In some, in some cases, they may take uh, the money they make and buy back stock, because if you buy back stock, you lower the amount of outstanding shares, which will propel um, your earnings per share upwards. So if everything is the same in the company, same earnings, same profits as last year, the only thing different is that you bought stock back, you could show that there's zero growth in sales and really zero growth in earnings, but the earnings per share have gone up because you, per, you bought back stock. And a lot of companies are buying back stock aggressively to meet their earnings goals. So that's one reason 
every year they're able to consistently meet or beat their earnings expectations because they're managing their earnings. Okay, so forecasting earnings per share. Um, a consensus forecast is superior to an individual, but you're going to be, so your team is sort of a consensus. So everybody in your, on your team should be looking at and thinking about the earnings, um, possible earnings per share. A time series forecast, looking at um, historical data to make earnings forecasts. So if you do, you have five years worth of financial statements, you can do a year over year trend for each year. Then you can sort of see that every year they're trending a 10 to 15 percent increase in earnings per share. That must be what they're engineering or targeting. So it's a good estimate for next, for next year as well. So of course the more evidence you can get is going to favor uh, analysts over statistical models and predicting um, what's actually going to be reported. So statistical models are helpful, but typically uh, evidence is a lot more helpful. Unfortunately, analysts are frequently wrong in their earnings estimates. And this is what we're talking about here is not so much the company guidance, it's going beyond the company guidance and going into estimating independently of the company to see, you know, how much are they really likely to generate in earnings, not what the earnings number they're estimating for us, which are managed lower. Okay. So the earnings surprises, we all love these earnings surprises because we're expecting $5 per share, we get $6 per share, and suddenly a lot of people hear this news, it makes a lot of waves, it gets in all the news circuits, and the, the, the company spikes a great deal that first day. By and large though, whatever that spike is for the earnings surprise, mu much of that's given back over the next couple days of trading as people kind of just get numb to it. So, so unexpected information is going to make a, re a revision in the stock price. Um, so we really have to look at the level of growth in earnings and the market's expectation for the earnings. So even though um, the company may say we're getting $5 per share earnings, if the market's expecting $6 and expecting that surprise, then when it actually happens, the stock may not move much at all because it's all been expected and priced in already. It's really the earnings surprises that nobody has forecasted, expected, or priced into the stock that move the stock price the most. And those are truly much rarer. So even though we do still have these earnings surprises, a lot of them aren't big surprises because they're expected. Okay. So regardless of the detail and the complexity, analysts and investors are, they still seek an estimate of earnings. And because they want to, um, they also want to pair that with a justified PE ratio to determine the intrinsic value. So earnings are one important component. The other very important component is price to earnings ratio. Is that likely to maintain, increase, or decrease? So if the company's PE is 10, but we're forecasting an increase to 12 based on the industry's increasingly good prospects, the bull market, and just the growth of this company, we expect that next year their, their PE should move from 10 to 12. Even if earnings per share don't change, the stock price is still going to go up because the company is certainly considered more valuable. So a PE of 10 with a $5 earnings gives you a $50 stock price. A PE of 12 with a $5 earnings gives you a $60 stock price. So what we ultimately what we want as investors is discover a company where we feel the earnings, the PE multiple is going to increase and the earnings are going to increase because that gives us a double impact of stock price. So we're always involved in predicting earnings per share and PE multiples even though we have an uncertain future and mistakes will be made and, and outlooks can be different, we still want to get a good handle on where we think the PE and the stock price should be. And this is critical for any analyst report to give an, an estimate of where they think the stock price, I'm sorry, the earnings per share is likely to be and how they think the PE multiple is likely to change or remain the same. And from those two pieces of information, your expected earnings per share, your expected new PE ratio, you get your stock price for next year. And it has to be stated in your analyst report, otherwise the analyst report's almost worth nothing then. Because that's what people really, the bottom line of what people want to know is where is the stock going to be? Should I buy it? And if you have a buy recommendation, your stock better be moving higher. And if you have, you know, so if, if someone has a buy recommendation but the stock's going to go down $10, how is that a buy? You're confused. You know, that's what a buy recommendation has to be, showing the stock price is going to be higher. Um, so what is securities analysis? Again, it's a process of gathering and organizing information, some of that you've done already, and using it to determine the intrinsic value of a, of a share of common stock. So in simple terms, getting data 
and using that to determine where the stock price will be next year so you can make a recommendation of whether or not to buy the stock. And you could do this for yourself or you could do this as an employee for a company, for other investors who will pay for this information or just for the company who wants to make investments in this area. Okay, so intrinsic value, to reiterate, because it's important, um, it's a fundamental, uh, through the fundamental analysis, we're supposed to discover what the intrinsic value of a stock is. And hopefully, comparing that to today's stock price gives us an idea of whether or not the stock is a buy. So the intrinsic value of the company is rarely the actual trading price of the stock. So, but intrinsic value is what we want to know because the stock price on average will gravitate to the intrinsic value as more people understand what that is. So if you can get to that understanding before most investors and trade based on that and other investors who are slow to catch up finally realize that, you'll be ahead of the game. So you only want to buy a stock if its market price doesn't exceed what the, the intrinsic value or what the investor thinks it's worth. Uh, and the intrinsic value depends on many factors. Of course, Estimating future cash flows, we saw in the valuation process, is an important aspect of the intrinsic value. The discount rate, which is sort of the cost of capital or your acquired rate of return, and which, is, and which is also incorporated into the amount of risk, which is typically measured by beta. So these are things that are going to affect, affect the intrinsic value of a stock. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and continue this in part two, um, which will be next time.